is a great pleasure to have Eric Van Aert for the second part of the lecture, Iboleptic Operators and Index Theory. So yesterday we heard about the Iboleptic Operators and today, I guess, is the index time. There you go. Thank you very much. Slide. You did the first slide. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marcelo. Um, yeah, so um, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'll, I'll um, it, it will be, I decided here and there, it will be perhaps a little bit abstract. Um, if you're not familiar, not an expert in index theory, some of these things um, may or may not be fully understandable. But what I'm hoping to do is at least convey some information that for, especially for people uh, with quantum geometry or you know, more geometric uh, background in general, that um, I'm hoping to convey some of the results in index theory of, uh, of such hyperelliptic operators that maybe can prompt uh, some useful interaction. So uh, I'm not attempting to, you know, give a, an actual detailed course in this material, but more hopefully um, convey some of the flavor of what's going on here and what, what kind of input would be useful from my perspective. So, um, so let me just start again with, uh, because that's always a good reference point, the more classical theory of elliptic operators. So uh, I discussed them yesterday at some length, uh, but I never really, I mumbled a little bit about vector bundles. So let me be a little bit more precise about what happens if you have two vector bundles playing a role, this will most interesting geometric operators um, in index theory will act on sections in vector bundles. So you do basically the same thing you do for scalar operators. So you um, you express it in local coordinates. Uh, you trivialize the two vector bundles, um, and then the one novel feature is that the coefficients, the a alphas, uh, are matrix valued. Right, it's the, you have, so sections in a bundle just becomes vector value functions locally, and um, the operator will be, if you like, it's a matrix. Okay, so usually it's written this way, uh, where you where you just uh, take the differential operators out of the matrix, and then you have clean um, numerical matrices with complex coefficients as um, leading leading the monomials. All right, so you have to just, uh, I don't know how familiar this is, but um, this is a slight a slight change. And so the principal symbol, once you accept that, the principal symbol is attained in the same way. You replace derivative by multiplication by C. And then uh, what you get is again a polynomial, <clears throat> but now the polynomial is matrix valued. And I'm gonna write it uh, from now on as a polynomial, as a function of x and c, so it's a smooth function of x. It's polynomial in c. Okay, and then the definition. By definition, um, an operator is elliptic if this principal symbol is invertible, but now invertible as a matrix uh, for each x and for each c other than zero. Okay, so before. Um, we said the symbol is not zero, but the point of being not zero is that it's invertible. So invertibility is the key thing. Okay, so this is the definition. And then um, if your manifold is closed, so it doesn't have a bound, it's compact and has no boundary, then every elliptic operator is a Fredholm operator with finite dimensional kernel. So if you're interested in PDEs, uh, an equation like PU equals zero will have a finite a finite number of uh, linearly independent solutions. And the co-kernel is also finite dimensional. So PU equals V, the V will have to satisfy a finite number of linear conditions for there to be a solution. So the thing you do in index, the, the index is the difference of these two dimensions. And I just wanna make, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with index, um, the reason you take this difference is that even if you're interested in, say, the dimension of the kernel, um, that dimension of the kernel is very unstable under perturbations of the operator, whereas the index is very stable. So, for example, 
any continuous perturbation of the coefficients of p, uh, the dimension of the kernel can jump around, but the index doesn't. And the same uh, holds. This is two actually follows from one if you think about it. Um, the lower order terms of the operator are, are completely irrelevant for the calculation of the index, but certainly not for the dimension of the kernel. Okay, so for index theory, the the definition of the operator is fairly, um, I would say, uh, rough. You you don't need very very precise definitions of the operators. You often for example, uh, Laplacians, you could have various Laplacians and they mostly vary, uh, they differ in their lower order terms and as far as index theory goes, that all of that is, is really not relevant. So the construction of operators for the purpose of index theory is often easier than say if you want to do spectral theory. Right, for spectral theory, you want the full complete operator, the lower order terms are important, but here they're not. All right, so for the index theory starts from the observation that the index, uh, because of the stability properties, first of all, the lower order terms are relevant, so you're really only looking at the principal symbol, sigma naught, and then secondly, you can perturb that principal symbol and it doesn't affect the index. So now we're slowly inching towards a purely topological um, datum. <clears throat> and so the first uh, step here, um, which Atiyah and Singer did, is to find a convenient way to encode what information is contained in this principal symbol in a, in a topological setting. So um, here's the principal symbol again, the formula, so matrix valued polynomial. Uh, that's in coordinates, but there's a canonical way to interpret this. The C variables are actually um, it's fairly easy to check that C variables are invariantly defined uh, as elements in the cotangent bundle, vectors in the cotangent bundle. And then the principal symbol, uh, okay, so it's not really a matrix, it's of course a homomorphism from the fiber of E to the fiber of F. Okay, we trivialized those earlier, but if you don't trivialize them, this is what you get canonically. And then um, for an elliptic operator, of course, these these will be isomorphisms. <clears throat> By the way, this is why for an elliptic operator, the, the vector bundles E and F are often not isomorphic, but they have to have at least the same fiber dimension. Otherwise, you cannot have an elliptic operator. OK, and so this is uh, the first step, is that um, the principal symbol can be thought of as an isomorphism of vector bundles. Now, uh, you pull back E and F to the cotangent bundle, via the projection, and then simply restrict to the unit uh, sphere bundle in that cotangent bundle. Okay, so this is an isomorphism of vector bundles, and the index depends on this isomorphism, and only up to homotopy. So now we really have uh, some topological data here, um, and that topological data should determine the index in some way. And that was, you could say, this is the index problem before a T.S. Singer um, I think there was some awareness, uh, Gelfand, I think, posed a problem of this type. You know, find some topological formula uh, that extracts the index from this vector bundle uh, uh, isomorphism. So here's one way to do it. <coughs> um, uh, it's convenient to compactify the cotangent bundle. So what I do is, I, I wish I could draw a picture, but I didn't have time to uh, scan pictures. Uh, you take the ball bundle, two copies of the ball bundle and you glue them along their boundary so that would be an equator then and that gives you a, a sphere bundle of course the spheres <coughs> sigma m is a bundle of spheres and each fiber of sigma m is a compactification of rn rn being the fiber of t star m okay you, you add one point and infinity in each fiber i hope that's clear if it's not clear uh, please let me know <coughs> Okay, so this is a compact uh, space, fiber to over M. And then the principal symbol, sigma naught, can be used to make a vector bundle on this compactified space. You simply take... Um, Sorry e to interrupt you, uh, I'm a bit yeah. slow. Can you, can you explain me again how you glue them? So you take these two uh, ball bundles over M? Yeah, yeah. And, and then... then each each has a boundary, S star M, the sphere bundle is a boundary, 
and so you glue uh, them along, along the boundary. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Got it. Thanks a lot. Right? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I, I like I said, I wish I could draw a picture, but I didn't have time to scan pictures. But um, right, so each ball is a disc, and one becomes the upper hemisphere, and the other becomes the lower hemisphere. Say, so, right? And S star M would perfect. Thanks a lot. Thanks yeah. a lot. Sure. All right. So now um, on one of the balls. <clears throat> ball bundles you you use e so you pull back e to this ball bundle <clears throat> on the other one say the lower hemisphere you put f and then along the equator which is the cosphere bundle you have your principal symbol which is an isomorphism from e to f in fact it's an isomorphism exactly on the on the cosphere bundle and restricted to the cosphere bundle so you use that to glue the two together kind of clutch them together and you get a single vector bundle Okay, and um, this now is a fairly convenient uh, object because <clears throat> a homotopy of principal symbols will not affect the isomorphism class of this vector bundle. So this is a very convenient object. So the um, the index of P will somehow, you should be able to extract it from this vector bundle uh, up to isomorphism even. Okay, so this is roughly the, uh, a TN signal is slightly different, but this is an equivalent way of uh, presenting what they did. Okay, so we know how to extract, uh, you know, invariants from vector bundles. You use characteristic classes. So, for example, uh, one way to do is choose a connection, like take its curvature. That's a two-form and endomorphism value two-form or a matrix value two-form, if you like, locally. Uh, and then there's a formula. The formula is not so important for the talk. I just wanted to, you know, be honest. There it is. You take the exponential in just in the formal sense. Um, this gives even forms, right? R is a two form matrix. And so you exponentiate, you get even forms and then you trace so that you get an actual differential form. And uh, that differential form the cohomology class of that form, it's, first of all, it's a closed differential form and the cohomology class is independent of the choice of connection. So it really only depends on the vector bundle. And this is called a churn character. So now we have uh, from the principal symbol, uh, we have constructed an actual cohomology class, even on M. Okay, so this is uh, topological data and then it's, Again, it's not hard to show that because of the stability of the index, the properties that it has, that the why? index should depend on this cohomology class. Why do you, is this not the class of sigma m? It is. Uh, so sigma would be an element on uh, the cotangent bundle. But uh, then I have to explain what it means to take a churn character of a K-theory class, which I wanted to avoid. So I just made it into... Okay. I, mean, I mean, the class that you constructed this on, on capital sigma of M, no? Oh, sorry. You're right. That's a typo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. No Very problem. Right. I, got, I, I didn't understand the question. You're right. That's a typo. Yeah. Um, all right. So here's the sequence of steps, right? Operator, principal symbol, vector bundle cohomology class, right? And then here's the theorem. So um, you take that cohomology class and then you wedge it with, note the second one, this is the Todd class of the complexified tangent bundle. Uh, again, it's not so important what that is, but the point is it doesn't depend on the operator, but it does depend on the manifold, obviously, the second uh, form you see there, the Todd class. And this formula, I, I would like to actually point out this formula, uh, the formula itself, uh, the, you know, integrating churn character wedge with a Todd class, of course, this is not a formula due to T.S. Singer. This is a formula uh, due to Herzbruck, uh, and it is essentially the, the, the Riemann-Roch theorem that he proved in higher dimensions. Uh, but the point is that, the, that and this is, uh, we'll also, we'll see this when we get to hyperloop, there's only one index formula uh, in essence, which is this one. Uh, the question is always exactly what to feed into it. Okay, so all index formulas will, in some sense, look like like this. 
Um, Sorry, um, is there maybe here a Tom isomorphism or again, like some pullback missing maybe? There's a pullback. So the, when I switch with Todd, of course, you, you pull back the uh, tangent, the tangent model of M to sigma M. OK, thanks. So I'm being a little sloppy here. I'm, I'm wedging uh, forms on sigma M with forms on M. This is the same confusion as. Uh... <laughs> so yeah, the other thing you can do is take the churn character of sigma and then integrate in the fiber first. And then you end up on M. Uh, but yeah, you're right. So there's a pullback. All right, so um, what uh, I didn't want to get into is, uh, so I use this compactification sigma M. Um, it is, once you know a little bit of K theory, it's actually more convenient to think of this, uh, instead of a single vector bundle as an element in the K theory of T star M, but T star M, because it's not compact, it's really a relative K theory group. So I, I wanted to avoid all that. But just for information, since this will be useful for later. The actual K-theory group that uh, the symbol lands in very naturally is in the K-theory of the cotangent bundle. Okay, so, um, okay, any questions about that? So that's just like I said, this is for reference, a little bit as comparison for what is to come. So in short again, so you, you take your operator, you look at its principal symbol by the basic properties of the index. Uh, the index will only depend on the principal symbol up to homotopy. And then the job is to find some convenient way to express the topology that's contained in the, in the symbol and then express the index just as a topological formula, uh, which is what they did. Okay, so this is generally how index theorems work. Um, and now, uh, I will discuss um, ways to do this for Heisenberg elliptic operators. Um, I'm going to be a little bit abstract here, and I, I do that on purpose because I'm not entirely sure um, in which setting these theorems might prove to be interesting in geometry. Okay, so I want to indicate uh, to the audience here uh, that there's a very, very general theory here. <clears throat> Um, and I, like I said, I'm not entirely sure what the interesting applications might be. So I want to uh, give some sense of um, what kind of theorems uh, are out there. So let me start with, first of all, it doesn't have to be context structure. It could be any distribution on a manifold. So I'll just call it H again. Um, there is some generalization of the Heisenberg calculus. The model groups there are not going to be Heisenberg groups. There will be other nilpotent groups. Um, moreover, they might not be the same uh, at each point in the manifold. So these, it, this is, I think, familiar from Subraman in geometry. There's uh, certain nilpotent groups, a bundle of nilpotent groups associated to such a setup. Uh, but there is a calculus, a well-defined calculus, and uh, and so there are. There's a well-defined notion of elliptic operator in this. In this calculus, I don't know if there's a good name for it, so I'll refer to them as H elliptic, um, for lack of a better expression. I don't like hypoelliptic because that's it is much stronger than hypoelliptic. They are all hypoelliptic operators, um, but they're, they're of a very special type. Okay, you can even uh, again, I don't know if this is of interest to anyone, but you can even pick a filtration of distributions if you like, uh, as long as this filters the Lie algebra vector fields. And then uh, again, there's a Heisenberg calculus and there are hypoelliptic operators associated to such data. Okay, anytime you have a closed manifold and an operator is elliptic in any of these calculi, um, you will have a frenum operator and an index that depends on the principal symbol. So this is just a very, very general fact. Uh, and in principle, there is a whole range of potential index problems here. Um, but unless they are interesting for some geometric reason, I, I think it's not necessarily very uh, useful to try to work them out. OK, just uh, some indication how this works. So again, pick an arbitrary distribution, not necessarily a context structure. Uh, there's, I hope, familiar uh, 
a bunch of Lie algebras associated to such a thing. So at each point of the manifold X, you can make a two-step uh, graded nilpotent Lie algebra. The um, the normal bundle TM mod H is central, and then there's a bracket. It's essentially the bracket of vector fields. Um, but you're, you know, it's uh, it's a little a small exercise to to uh, see that this is well defined. So you take two elements, two vectors in H, the, the fiber of H. You extend it to sections of H. This, of course, uh, involves cho choices. And then you take the bracket of those vector fields, uh, and then restrict it again to X. Now modulo uh, H. This is well defined. So independent of the extensions that you chose. So this gives a bracket structure. Um, so we got a nilpotent Lie algebra here. <clears throat> if H is a context structure, in fact, it's an if and only if. So uh, this Lie algebra is the Heisenberg Lie algebra. If and only if H is a context structure. H can be something else. You get different Lie algebras here. All right, I'm going to use some notation. Um, this bundle H plus the normal bundle, of course, it's non-canonically isomorphic to the tangent bundle. And so I'll just use uh, some suggestive notation here, TM with a subscript H. I'll denote the tangent bundle, roughly speaking, where each fiber uh, is given this nilpotent group structure. And then I'm, uh, what I need is an algebra, a non-commutative algebra associated to this uh, bundle of groups. What you do is you take compactly supported functions, smooth functions, and the product is not pointwise multiplication. The product is to take their convolution product in each fiber. Each fiber is a nilpotent group, and so you can convolve to compactly supported functions. You get a new compactly supported function. So this gives me an algebra, <clears throat> non commutative algebra associated to this data. <clears throat> okay, now um, what what do we get when we have elliptic operators, or so-called, let's say, hyperelliptic operators or elliptic in this H calculus associated to a distribution? The principal symbol, which uh, is very similar to what I explained for uh, in the setting of Heisenberg groups. It's, um, again, I, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'll leave that as a suggestive hint, um, but it's, it's really very similar. Um, what is uh would if you know a little bit k theory and if you don't you'll have to take my word for it it's almost by definition the way this thing is constructed uh, will give you an element in algebraic k theory okay N note that this uh algebra cc infinity so it's a ring if you like um it's a non-commutative ring so we can't use topological k theory but the algebraic k theory is well defined and this symbol in a very natural way, you don't have to do anything to it. We'll define an element uh, in this K-theory group. And then um, non-commutative geometry, this is where this comes in. It comes in in various places, so I'm hiding it. Uh, there's a lot of non-commutative geometry techniques in the background if you want to prove any of the things I'm saying. Uh, but here I can't avoid mentioning it. There is what is called a Tom isomorphism due to Alain Kahn in um, in algebraic K theory, um, and this applying this uh, in this setting gives a very natural homomorphism to the group, the K theory group that T and Singer used, K theory of the cotangent. So that's topological K theory. Okay, so I want to pause here for a second because a lot of this is very abstract. But what it means is that if you have any have a hyperliptic operator in the Say generalized Heisenberg calculus for any distribution H on the manifold M, and you have then uh, there is a well defined element in the K theory of T star M that you can extract from the principal symbol. Okay, so this is a very strong result, if you like, because it means that uh, the principal symbol behaves very similarly to um, the, that of elliptic operators. And <clears throat> um, OK, so then uh, you can do the same thing. You can take its uh, churn character as before, and you get a cohomology class. Right, so, so is there a question? I, yeah, so 
I have no intuition for the the K group that you write on the left hand side. Like, mm -hmm. is this a gigantic thing? I have no like intuition so, for this. So algebraic K theory is so so uh, topological K theory is built out of vector bundles. Right. Right. So a vector bundle algebraically, a vector bundle is a finitely generated projective module over the algebra functions C of M. Mm -hmm. So you take the sections in the vector bundle. So uh, K theory for rings, it, it consists of finitely generated projective modules over the ring. Okay. Up, up to certain isomorphisms, etc. And that, that so it's it's a complete, uh, it's very closely related. It's just an algebraic reformulation of algebra of uh, topological K theory, if you like. Okay. No. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so the K theory, um, unfortunately, this is just the way it is for index theory. K theory, a lot of people like to skip the K theory and just go to cohomology. For example, um, the heat kernel method uh, proves index theory without using any K theory, and people are proud <laughs> that, they, that they're not using K theory. But it is unfortunately just the case that index theory is best done in K theory. Uh, K theory is, is made for index theory and vice versa. So it's hard to avoid K theory if you want to do anything. Uh, can I ask a question? Hmm. Um, maybe could, could you please explain what exactly you mean by a symbol here? Because, because last time we saw that you were taking the non commutative Fourier transform. Uh, yeah. And there was an operator instead of a function. Yeah. yeah. So here I'm uh, I, actually that's a good question. So I'm skipping the the Fourier the, the harmonic analysis. So what I'm doing is simply you take your operator, you freeze coefficients. I'll, I'll try to show an example later. So you freeze coefficients at each point. Now you get a uh, translation variant operator at each point on some nilpotent group. That bunch of data, uh, as such, determines a K-theory class. Mm. So okay. there's, no, there's no need here for the, um, yes, for the harmonic analysis. Mm. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm, like I said, I'm being, um, I'm being a little bit, this is a little abstract and vague, but um, I'm trying to get some more philosophical points across. And here, the point I'm trying to get across is that there's a very uh, large class of hyperliptic operators in various geometric settings. And from the point of index theory, they, they all have, this is kind of a, a strong result. They, they, the, the principal symbol in all these different incarnations uh, all always determines a cohomology class or K-theory class in the same group. So that's a fairly strong result. And there's a theorem. Um, this was basically the work I did in my thesis that uh, for all these calculi, the um, index is computed using the Atiyah Singer formula. So there's no different formulas uh, at, at the root of it. It's always the same formula that calculates the index. Okay, so th this is. Uh, uh, an abstract, abstract result, but it's an important result because it indicates that uh, there are all kinds of index formulas that you could derive in different settings. What is the problem to get explicit formulas is to actually calculate what this class is. Okay, so you're right to ask what is the principal symbol. So you, you first need to figure out what's the principal symbol, what is the K theory class in this non commutative ring. And then how, what does it uh, correspond to in the topological group? So in other words, how do you get a vector bundle out of it? You might say <clears throat> that problem is not solved. It's only solved uh, for specific cases and uh, particularly for foliations. It turned out to be quite easy. Uh, and for contact manifolds. Excuse uh, me, just to see if I'm following. That, so this Psi is this uh, con uh, isomorphism thing? This Yes. Okay. Yeah. This, is, so this is the not explicit thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the um, the theorem of uh, the Kahn-Tom isomorphism is a theorem of the type, you know, there exists an isomorphism, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, it doesn't really tell you very easily what, given a specific element on the left, uh, what the K-theory class on the right 
is. Um, so that that's part of the challenge in applying this thing. OK, thanks, thanks. Yep. OK, so this is um, you might say is sort of a blueprint for index theorems, but it's not. You know, the, the, there's a lot of work to be done to make this useful or computable, and the whole difficulty is in computing this this homomorphism. Right, because you, you're sort of going from 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 ring a theory of rings and modules over rings to uh, vector bundles, and that's a difficult step. But in principle, so it's good to know that these theorems, in principle, there are they, they exist, and uh, like I said, it unless so if there is a setting where this might be interesting then it becomes interesting to try to uh, to solve this index problem but um, for me unless there are examples uh, that are motivating um, it's it's a little bit uh, well i have better things to do let me put it that way and try to uh, figure this out in each, each individual case because the, the this I do this uh, map psi will will really depend on the geometry. So in each individual case, for example, for contact manifolds, uh, there's a solution, but that solution is very specific uh, to to contact manifolds. It doesn't generalize uh, to other settings. And the same for foliations. It's actually quite easy for foliations. And again, the solution that you that works with foliations doesn't work in any other setting. So the comp computation of this map psi here. Uh, is heavily dependent on the geometry of the distribution. And therefore, so this, this theorem becomes only explicit uh, once you've done that computation. All right, so this was sort of the first point I wanted to get across. I'm sorry it's um, fairly abstract what I'm saying here, but um, I think it is worth making this point. Okay, so let me indicate how uh, what the solution is on a contact manifold. This is actually quite interesting, uh, but but um, there's there's two things uh, I think I would like to emphasize here. First of all, this theorem here says that the, that you know this is essentially the formula the same formula as that of Atiyah and Singer modulo this computation of this element, this K theory element. But then once you see the final solution, it doesn't look anything like the Atiyah Singer theorem anymore. Uh, there will still be a Chern class and a Todd class, because all index formulas basically have that. Uh, but it will have a it, once the dust settles, it will look very different. And uh, the reason is exactly this is computation of psi. Okay, so here are some of the steps. So um we start by freezing coefficients. So you, you yeah. have your hypothesis. So Sorry. you're saying what the solution is, but what's the problem? We're the taking now a function. I mean, your operator will be. Heisenberg elliptic. OK, it's a general. Uh, OK, it's a general operator then. A Heisenberg elliptic operate on a contact manifold. That's, that's the problem. But so this is from here. So we have here I, H is the contact structure. I take a, a linear differential operator that's elliptic in the Heisenberg calculus, so a Heisenberg hyperelliptic operator. But there are there are vector bundles, or is it on function? Uh, the vector bundles are not a problem, so I'm I'm not mentioning them because it just adds a lot of notation and confusion. But um, it's it's already difficult enough in this case for for mm -hmm. scalar operators. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the solution doesn't really change when you have vector bundles. It, it doesn't add any complication. It just adds notational difficulty. So I'm just going to assume that it's a good question. So I'm just assuming that these are scalar operators for simplicity. But it, uh, in the published versions, there, there are vector bundles everywhere. Yeah. So here, P, this operator P is Heisenberg elliptic operator, linear differential operator, and it's scalar. There's no vector bundles here. And again, that's just for uh, to keep it simple. OK, so with our uh, at every point of a Lie algebra, here it's the Heisenberg Lie algebra. This is um, so I did it yesterday using coordinates or I used Darboux's theorem, but this is a more canonical way to approach it. Um, 
this Lie algebra, Heisenberg Lie algebra, is canonically defined on a contact manifold, and the highest order part, if you freeze coefficients at x and you take the highest order part, this is a canonically defined element in the universal enveloping of, uh, of this Lie algebra. But this doesn't involve Darboux's theorem. You don't need to uh, to do that. And that is also how it works in general if you have different distributions. So this also sort of answers the question uh, earlier, what, what do I mean by principal symbol? In some sense, this family of, um, of, oper of, of P sub X is, is the principal symbol for the purpose of this, um, of this theory. Okay, so Heisenberg elliptic meant that the um, in the representation theory, these highest order parts are, are invertible if you represent them in the Schrodinger representations, as long as h bar is not zero. And in fact, yesterday I indicated uh, it suffices to consider h bar as plus one and minus one. And so that's what we're going to do next. I take h bar as plus one and minus one. There are, of course, at each point you have a Hilbert space, which yesterday I indicated concrete as L2 of Rn. However, there is a, for purpose of geometry, I need to use a slightly different model, which is, uh, for those of you who know the representation theory, this is the barkman fock representation. It's equivalent. Um, and so what you get is a, at each point you have a Hilbert space. So this gives sort of a bundle, a vector bundle, if you want to call it that, whose fibers are Hilbert spaces. And there's two of them. And, uh, on each one you have, in each fiber, you have an operator with an inverse. So roughly speaking, an invertible operator. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> just for, um, again, it's not so important. The, the Hilbert spaces are obtained from the context structure. So H is uh, the context structure. It has a symplectic structure using D theta, if theta is the context form, and then you uh, make a complex vector bundle out of it that involves some choices, but um, those choices are again are not relevant for the index. Okay, you take all the symmetric powers, and then there's some way to complete this into um, into a Hilbert space. So this is a somewhat complicated uh, amount of data, but uh, the good news is that you can uh, cut this down to something of finite rank. So. Um, the bad news is that we don't know exactly how large the uh, the rank of these vector bundles needs to be. There's no a priori value of, of n, the capital N here, that works. It depends on the operator. And in examples, if you calculate this in examples, it's always completely obvious uh, which value you should pick, uh, but there's no sort of uh, formula or algorithm for it. Okay, but so there are two the point is there are two vector bundles now on N made out of the context structure, complex vector bundles. And uh, the principal symbol of the operator gives essentially two automorphisms. Uh, one So each vector bundle comes with an automorphism, one from the H bar as plus one representations, another from the H bar equals minus one representations. Okay, so this is a... Uh, maybe complicated looking procedure. What you end up with though is a fairly simple thing. You have two vector bundles on M and each one is equipped with an automorphism and the automorphism uh, encodes the principal symbol. Okay, so this is the geometric data, the topological data that um, you can extract here from, from the principal symbol. All right, so then uh, again, um, you, you need K theory. This determines an element in K1, the odd K theory of M. So we get two elements. And then uh, again, by K theory, uh, uh, general K theory facts, this gives two elements in K0 of T star M. Okay, so this is a, a solution to this problem. Like how, what, how do you, this is, a, this is, if you like, there's a theorem, the thing you get in the end you add up these two elements, um, that is psi of sigma h. Okay, but it, it looks, it's, it's, none of this has anything to do with the Tia Singer theorem, obviously. This is very unique to context structure. So, so the last things are topological K theory. 
Yes. The last so, the, yeah. so upper when I write an upper uh, the, the upper zero upper one indicates it's topological. It's contravariant, right? Right. So so somehow you have hidden the psi or or didn't get. It. So the theorem is that the, what I just constructed is psi of sigma h. Uh -huh. Okay. That, that, that's a theorem. I should have probably made a slide. That the theorem is that for a contact manifold, so back to this thing, uh, this element, which is abstractly defined here, okay, this is a general. This works in general for any distribution. So on a contact manifold, uh, the thing I get at the end here by adding up these two classes, that is psi of h, and so then here is an index theorem. So I've now computed psi. Of sigma h here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, and you can see there's a lot of compl a complication here in that in that red bit. The the black part is just the usual formula, but uh, you need to do quite a bit of work to un to unravel what what goes what you what to feed into the Turing character. OK, so uh, an alternative description, and now it really doesn't look like a Tia Singer anymore. You, you, you can use these two isomorphisms uh, to get vector bundles on M cross S1. So you have, uh, you know, I don't know, it's a clutching construction. So if you have a, a vector bundle with an automorphism, you can make a vector bundle on M cross S1. And then this is what the index formula looks like. OK, so I, again, I, I, I'm not trying to uh, get into too much detail about exactly what the formula is. What I want to, want, to, want to get across is that on a contact manifold, these things can actually be calculated. So if you have examples, um, here's an example uh, operator I discussed yesterday. You have a subplaplacian plus uh, gamma Z, Z being the read field. And remember the coefficient has to avoid a certain set of values in a complex plane. Um, then this is a Heisenberg elliptic operator. It's a hypoelliptic operator, and it will be a Fredholm operator if M is closed. OK, so now you just get kind of winding number uh, type thing. Uh, for each val forbidden value Z in this uh, set of values, I n, I n plus 2, etc., uh, gamma minus Z will be a map to a circle, if you like, up to homotopy, and therefore it determines a, a one co cycle. So for each value set, you get a one co cycle. And then here's an index formula. Okay, again, you see Toth classes appearing. <clears throat> um, these are not infinite sums, as only finitely many of these terms are, are not zero. <clears throat> if you look at this formula, it doesn't look anything like a Tia Singer, uh, so it's hard to see how it came from the Tia Singer formula. But it is very explicit, so you can, um, you know, I've done just for fun, I did some computation on three manifolds. You can figure out whether the index is, you know, two or minus three, or it's actually, you can find exactly what the integer is. Um, and that's mainly what I want to, what I want to show with this formula. The formula itself is maybe not so important, but it's very explicit. That's what I'm trying to get across. So what this, why I think of this as solution is that this here, right, this whole construction that I outlined here is very abstract. Um, and in general, if you pick some arbitrary distribution H, uh, it will be, well, I don't know how to compute this. Okay, but there is a theorem, but for contact manifolds, you get something like this. Which, which is computable, which is very explicit. Right, so that's really the point. It's not so much the, the specific formulas. Mm, Eric, oh, sorry, Patrick, I think you're going to ask. Yeah, so, so this part with the uh, third class depends only on the contact structure, right? Correct. Okay, so, so you can, and can you, for, for instance, for contact three manifold, can you, uh, I don't know, related to the Euler class of the of the contact structure or something like this? Uh, so we're for three manifolds. Um, so the top class is a fairly simple thing there. I think it's something like um, uh, 
I wish I could write it. So the symmetric tensors, of course, are so first of all, this H10 is just a line bundle. If you want a three manifold. So the symmetric tensors are just tensors. So they're they're a J tensor. Mm -hmm. And the Todd class formula is something like one plus one half first churn class of H10. Yeah, we just send as a Okay. Yeah, and then you multiply with J. If you take tensors, you multiply with J. So uh, you get a very, very simple uh, formula in that case. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah. Nice. yeah, so so like I said, I mainly want to um, argue here that by, by this example that um, these, these things can be calculated very explicitly. Right, so that's basically the first remark here. So the the I haven't even hinted at how this is proven. Um, a lot of this uses uh, algebraic K theory, C star algebras, groupoids, uh, various deformation theory arguments, uh, all of which are have been developed within non-commutative geometry. And um, interesting enough, all that machinery was developed to deal with elliptic operators and. Uh, a lot of what has been understood there applies to these uh, different settings, to these hyperelliptic operators, which is quite remarkable. Um, the other thing is that to get computable results, you still there's still problems to be solved, and particularly how to compute this map psi, and this will depend on the geometry. Now, here's a really uh, since. Uh, the point of this conference is to, you know, discuss open problems and see maybe a way forward. I think the real issue is to find geometric operators to which these theorems can be applied. Um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary if you want to contribute here to this program to understand exactly what is going on here, you know, exactly what these formulas are and uh, and how you prove them and what the K theory is, etc. Um, you can just take it for granted that these these index theorems exist. They, they're very computable. They're very explicit in the end. But what they're lacking uh, is input, and the input would be, as we already discussed yesterday, what what are are there good examples of geometric hyperelliptic operators uh, to which we can apply these theorems? That's really something um, I've, you know, I've been thinking about this, but I've not been able to come up with anything. Um, and it's it's really kind of unfortunate because they're very beautiful theorems um, with wide applicability, but um, so far no real applications in uh, in geometry. Okay, there are of course the obvious candidates: the Laplacian and is elliptic, the sub-Laplacian is hyperelliptic. Even Heisenberg hyperelliptic, but they do not have any interesting uh, applications in index theory. They have interesting applications in spectral theory, but not in index theory. Maybe Eric, because I think I don't understand this comment. I mean, the index you just computed in the previous slides, the slide wasn't it some sort of sub Laplacian? No, it's well, I guess it is, but it has a lower. See, the sub Laplacian, when I say sub Laplacian, I just mean the delta sub h. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, because okay, yeah, for me, I guess like it was allowing any comma. Okay, I, I see, I see. I yeah, so so the subplotting would allow um, first order terms in the direction of h in the contact direction, because those are order one; they're not detected uh, by the calculus. But as soon as you have a redirection uh, added to it, then then um, see the gamma. So to get an interesting index here, you can see it from the formula. This gamma needs to have some non-trivial winding around the forbidden values. But OK, you can choose a gamma, but the gamma doesn't arise from the from the context structure. Right. I mean, in fact, uh, I mean, is it true that I mean, it's kind of follow up of what Patrick was asking. So the right hand, the, the dot class kind of only seems to depend on the contact structure formally. So just yeah. kind of almost as a plain field, I guess. Yeah. And gamma is just, well, it's a topological thing. So this cannot possibly distinguish, let's say, over twisted from tight or anything like this, right? No, no, I don't think so, no. 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 Yeah, that's another problem with um, 
so the index, because it's so robust, um, you know, it's it's homotopy invariant, right? So that you can you can wobble everything around. The index is not going to change. Yeah, index is a fairly crude invariant, um, not very delicate. Let me to put it. Put it a vague, vague this leads me to a question I wanted to ask. But in so you're complaining that you have no geometric application in in this setting. But what are the geometric application of the usual elliptic? Uh, index theory because of, of course I know there is this beautiful index formula and, and we use uh, of course we use Riemann Rohr all the time when we are doing mm -hmm. holomorphic curves but, but what are the applications you have in mind in, in the oh, case beyond the uh, Riemann Rohr well the the you know the, um, so that's the question what are the applications of the Atiyah Singer theorem itself yes well there's a whole range of those right I mean it plays a role um, I mean, the simple, the simplest, the earliest ones is uh, the one I mentioned yesterday. So, for example, uh, does a closed manifold admit positive scale curvature? That's a clearly a geometric question. And um, if it so, application of the, the idea of theorem says if the A roof genus is, is non-zero, then the answer is no. It doesn't admit any positive scale curvature. So that's that's a kind of thing uh, I have in mind. It's a it's a it's a clearly a geometric statement, and the proof uses the Atiyah Singer theorem. Okay. Uh, other examples are uh, I think Milner, you know, proof that there exist uh, exotic spheres, seven spheres, uses the signature theorem, uh -huh. which which of course is also an, an incarnation of the Atiyah Singer theorem. Mm -hmm. What what I don't think because um, I've seen this in the description of the conference, like looking for invariance. There, I'm a little bit skeptical. I mean, index theory doesn't give you new invariance typically, um, exactly because the right hand side is topological, so the invariance already exists. They're, they're just ordinary characteristic classes. Um, what index theory does is it tells you that that particular invariant is equal to the index of an interesting operator, and it's because you can, for example, the positive scalar curvature example is a good example. Uh, the A roof genus is not a new invariant, it is already known. Uh, but the fact that it's equal to the index of a Dirac operator allows you, you can prove in certain cases that that index has to be zero. For example, if, if you have a positive scalar curvature manifold, the index of D has to be zero. And so that has an interesting consequence. Um, so your question is very, I think, very apt. Uh, applications of index theory are not, uh, you know, okay, you get new invariants. Um, I would personally not think that that's a relevant question. The, the invariants are just ordinary characteristic class invariants. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, if you have, if you have interesting like the Dirac operator has many, many applications in many settings, um, and the index theorem does. You know, Donaldson's theorem is another setting where it's used. Uh, you can use it to, you know, sometimes you use it the other way. The, you compute the topological side, and this, if it's positive, this tells you that the uh, differential oper uh, equation has has to have solutions, non-trivial solutions. That's another uh, type of application. But I don't think it will lead to new invariants. That is, unfortunately, um, I don't think, uh, I personally don't think that's a fruitful question. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but just uh, because I, uh, you said that this is invariant under homotopy, mm -hmm. but under homotopy within context structures, no, it's not. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So because an over twisted context structure, could maybe be homotoped through yeah. plane fields to a non over twisted one, but maybe not, uh, but not through good point through structures. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. Well, oh, but then, uh, th then Eric, I didn't understand. Then, can you show the formula once more? Because I had the impression that when you define this H10, is that really, I mean, so can, for can that really change within? Uh, no, in this particular example, that. Um, Todd class will definitely not change. Yeah. 
It, 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 yeah, you're right. I, I, uh, let me think about it. No, I, it won't. It would change if the complex structure changes. Uh, we have to think about that. Actually, is that? Uh, um, With, for instance, in dimensions three, it cannot change. I mean, not in any meaningful way. Right. So there is also an extra raised end. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. So I have a question and I have a raised hand. Oh, a raised I'm trying hand. to un unraise it now. Um, but uh, so it's a bit of a philosophical uh, question. So for me, like why K theory is so closely connected to differential operators is because, well, the space of Fratom operators is a classifying space for the topological K theory. Right. So is there like an obvious space that I like I didn't see in your story, but that's running behind for the other K theory here? Oh, you mean for um, for algebraic K theory? Yeah. No, no. So the classifying space uh, theory is strictly a topological. OK. There's no such theory that I'm aware of for uh, algebraic K theory. Okay. Thanks. There is a actually there is a, um, a uh, there is a definition of algebraic K theory that uses Fredholm operators, but generalized Fredholm operators. Uh, it's not so much a classifying space approach, but um, so this is not exactly what you're asking, but it's certainly true. If you want to look up a reference, uh, the, the theory is called KK theory. It was developed by um, Gennady Kasparov in the 80s. And he basically developed uh, K theory and K homology in a setting uh, where everything's all the elements in K theory and K homology are based on generalized Fredholm operators. So um, that is that is so. So the use of Fredholm operators in K theory is very fundamental, also in the algebraic setting, but not not in the classifying space sense, but in a different sense. Yeah, so so in some sense you could say anytime you have any kind of Fred Holm like problem, it will determine a K theory class. This is sort of a meta statement, I guess. And then the index problem is the problem to compute that K theory class in some sort of topologically understandable way using characteristic classes or something like that. Okay. Any I mean, I appreciate all the questions. They're good questions. So uh, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. So you guys are, are picking up on a lot of it. There is one more question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Eric. Um, my, my question is sort of related to what you have on, on this slide of remarks, because um, you, you mentioned this also in your last lecture of this problem of trying to find kind of geometric hypoelliptic operators. Right. Um, in in the the sort of hypoelliptic working group, there were a few ideas we were batting around. Um, one thing which sort of came up was um, trying to trying to relate maybe a natural operator to um, say like the induced operator on your contact manifold coming from some symplectic filling of a Dirac operator in the interior. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, because mm -hmm. that, that sort of fixes the, the dimension problem. And you yep. can sort of see an index is coming from the index of the thing, which should have a good index. I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, if you, I, I like, so Bob Juncker mentioned uh, this yesterday, and uh, I kind of perked up because I'm about to, maybe I'll, um, what I'm about to do will answer um, what I understand, I mean, what I understand currently, um, I think the idea of considering contact manifolds with fillings, symplectic fillings, is very interesting because it might exactly be the kind of additional data uh, that you need to get an interesting operator. So uh, what I'm about to explain is why I believe that if you just have uh, the contact manifold by itself, uh, you're not going to find an interesting um, index theorem, uh, geometric index theorem. You know, th this is interesting index theorem, but it's not geometric because of the 
uh, presence of gamma. Gamma is here so just some random thing you have to choose, and that's exactly the weakness of this theorem. Um, and then if you remove gamma, you just get the subplaplacian, and then and then again you have a non-interesting operator from from this perspective. But I think the idea of considering fillings is very interesting because that might just give you that uh, extraneous bit of data that is not just purely dependent on the contact manifold. Uh, that could so I, I like that idea a lot. I think that's uh, certainly something to explore. Um, I mean, it seems like maybe one one kind of natural thing would be to try and look for something like an APS index theorem, but with with the interior symplectic filling being something like an asymptotically complex hyperbolic manifold mm -hmm. and having a sort of CR contact infinity mm -hmm. being the sort of the natural infinity in lieu of what is typically yeah. like asymptotically cylindrical. Yeah. I think that was also done in the example that uh, Bob mentioned. Um, this this work by uh, Pierre Jules and uh, Gennady Kasparov on. They just looked at, um, I think, just balls, you know, in, in CN. It's a con has a context structure, and then I think they also did it for um, for quaternionic the quaternionic setting. So a ball in a quaternionic space with the quaternionic contact boundary, which is another co-dimension three distribution. So um, that might very well generalize to more general fillings. So I think this is definitely worth uh, thinking about. I'm sorry I haven't been able to. Uh, participate in any of the of the discussions, but I'll, I'll try to do that in the next few days. I'm kind of curious what you guys have been discussing. Yeah, I think this is the one the really the missing. Uh, missing ingredient in this uh, in this program. So it's I, okay. I, yeah, thanks. OK, so <clears throat> let me. Um, Unfortunately, I'm going to end on a pessimistic note, but it, it explains a little bit why I think that uh, you know this idea of looking at fillings, for example, is is uh, is interesting and maybe necessary to get something interesting uh, out of these theorems. So uh, I'm going to discuss. This is not an open problem. It's, it's something I see more as a uh, a kind of no-go theorem, um, and I frankly have never published it because it's just a negative result. Uh, but given that uh, currently there's interest again in this uh, type of stuff, I might write it up. Maybe somebody sees uh, a gap or a, you know a way around what I what I'm thinking here. So um, let me let me try to sketch it out. <coughs> um, so. What is a geometric operator, right? It's a somewhat vague ter term. We all sort of know what we what we mean, which examples we have in mind. But let me try to uh, find one way to um, axiomatize it a little bit. This is actually inspired by things that a T I did uh, way back when with elliptic operators. So I would suggest that uh, ge the geometric operators we're all familiar with, like the Laplacian or the Dirac operator, uh, are based on a model. And the model exists on Rn. It's typically a constant coefficient operator. But importantly, is that it, the model is not just translation invariant or constant coefficient. It's also equivariant for some specific structure group, some compact Lie group. So, for example, uh, the Laplacian on Rn, the standard Laplacian, is O of n equivariant or even invariant. And the Dirac operator on Rn again, which is also constant coefficient. Uh, is in equivariant not on their ON, so it's not rotation invariant, but it's equivariant on the, the spin group or the spin CN group. Okay, so I, <clears throat> I would like to say that uh, when you discuss the model of for these operators on RN, uh, it is very important to be aware of what the symmetry properties are of these models, uh, because uh, the the symmetry group determines which kinds of geometric manifolds have uh, such an operator. So, for example, um, uh, let me. Okay, here the examples are. Let me start with the examples. 
uh, you have a Laplacian on a Romanian manifold because you could say a Romanian val manifold, uh, if you have a Romanian structure, the structure group reduces from GLN to ON. Okay, and so that allows you to, the model operators will give you constant coefficient operators uh, at each point of the manifold, uh, simply because the, the, the choice of, of coordinates uh, um, doesn't alter the, um, the operator because of the symmetry. And so you get a principal symbol of an operator. And for index theory, of course, this doesn't quite give you, so as we know, uh, if you want an actual Laplacian, you have to do something more like you have the Laplace Beltrami operator or you have the Hodge Laplacian, but they all have the same highest order part. And, um, and for index theory, it's the highest order part is all that matters. So we don't have to worry too much about given the exact definition of the operator, but all we really need to define is a principal symbol. And defining a principal symbol is what I'm trying to argue here, simply amounts to two things. You have a model operator with a certain symmetry group, and then you have a geometric structure uh, that allows you to reduce the structure group to that symmetry. So, for example, why do you need a spincy manifold to have a Dirac operator? Well, the answer is very simple, because the model Dirac operator uh, its symmetry group is the spin C group. Okay, so uh, this is one way to, I guess, axiomatize if you want, uh, what, what you might mean by a geometric operator. Okay, then um, this is something Atiyah did in, I forget which paper this is in, early on in the 60s. The principal symbol determines the K theory class, so this now we're doing index theory and the K theory of T star M, but there's a natural map, the model operator uh, determines an element in equivariant K theory. So Q, I think, is the group. Why did I call it Q again? Oh, yeah, I couldn't call it G because G is the Heisenberg group. Okay, so this is the equivariant K theory of Rn, uh, equivariant for the group Q, which acts on Rn, and then it maps to uh, K theory of T star M if M has structure group Q. This is a very natural map, but this means that uh, the index theory, uh, you sort of have an abstract group here, this equivariant group, which holds all the models. Okay, and there's this, there's a, a beautiful theorem due to Bot, which also works equivariantly. That's Atiyah's uh, result. Uh, that this group is either Z or zero, depending on whether uh, you have an even dimensional manifold or an odd dimensional manifold. And so this says very immediately that if n is odd, then this model group is zero, and therefore all geometric elliptic operators on an odd dimensional manifold uh, will have zero, the element in K theory uh, is zero, and so in particular the index is zero, but, but this is much stronger even. Okay, so there are no geometric elliptic operators on odd dimensional closed manifolds that have non-zero index. Okay, so this is a well-known uh, fact, like I said yesterday, in invariants are typically invariants uh, of, of even dimensional manifolds. Okay, so this is the elliptic case. Um, so the conclusion is well-known, but this is an explanation for fairly, at a fairly high brow level. And uh, what I want to do now is apply this to a set of ideas to uh, contact manifolds, and the conclusion is somewhat sad. So uh, one possible reduction of the structure group is to U of R, right? You can uh, take your contact uh, hyperplane, it's symplectic, and you pick a compatible sort of structure group. The natural structure group would be the symplectic group, but you can reduce it further to uh, the unitary group. It acts, of course, by automorphisms on the Heisenberg group. And then to find a geometric operator would actually just amount to finding uh, a U of R equivariant model operator. By model operator here, I mean translation invariant operator on the Heisenberg group. So this uh, reduces the problem of finding geometric operators to finding certain uh, invariant elements on the Heisenberg group. Okay, then the K-theory class uh, so here I wrote C star, I can't avoid it, unfortunately. So this is again, this uh, non-commutative uh, ring. Um, 
The model operator will determine an element in some K theory group, which is on the left there. And uh, then there's a map to the K theory of T star M. So this is a lot of stuff. Uh, if you don't know K theory, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. There is a there's an this is analogous to the um, to the previous case, and it says that the symbol in K theory uh, is given by some sort of universal map like this. And then now comes the unfortunate conclusion by bot periodicity. Uh, the first is an isomorphism uh, from a non-commutative K theory to a topological K theory, and then that K theory group is zero. And again, the reason is very simple. This is because we're on an odd dimensional manifold. So the, uh, the conclusion here is very sad uh, that there are no geometric Heisenberg elliptic operators in closed contact manifolds with non-zero index. Okay, and, uh, and in fact, this conclusion is much stronger. It's not just that the index is zero, even uh, the class in K theory that they determine is zero. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry to end on a sad note, but um, like I said, I think I'll try to type this up, um, put it in an archive at least. Somebody sees a mistake somewhere, but um, I think this is correct. And so because of this kind of result that I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens if you if you do consider fillings, uh, because that does actually add additional data that is not just um, intrinsic to the contact manifold itself. Because I believe without extrinsic data, um, the, this conclusion is is really kind of a hard boundary for what is what we can find here. So this is why at some point I realized this and I stopped looking for uh, for such operators. Like I said, there's a, a paper by Raphael Ponge um, where he constructed an operator using the Ruhmann complex, uh, which looked very promising. And then some years later, he calculated the index and he found it to be zero. Um, and this kind of meta theorem that I'm discussing here would basically say that's unfortunately always going to be the case. If you find, if you're lucky enough to construct such an operator, um, it's going to have index zero. Okay, so that I, I think for me personally, that is not um, a, a useful direction to go in. So, um, sorry to interrupt. I don't know how much you have left, uh, or if I'm, this is that. Okay, so there are there are actually three questions, but before we get there, let's uh, thank you again.